Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome in. Um, good to see some of you guys. Go ahead and um, let us know your where you're from, um, how news has been for you. Um, you made it to the last workshop session, um, and we're glad you're here. So feel free just let us know where you are, where you're from, how you're doing, how's Noosa going. Um, we're just glad you're here. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Go ahead and um, just let us know where you're from, um, how you thought news has gone. Um, you've made it. You've made it to your last session um, for the conference, your last workshop session. We still have a few more things to do um, today and tomorrow, but um, we're just so glad you're here and we're glad that you have stuck it to the end with us. So welcome. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tabitha Butler, and I am excited to be your room host today for the Maintaining Service Continuity During Uncontrollable Circumstances. Um, you guys are going to enjoy hearing from Chris Harper today. Um, before we get started, just a reminder, I know you've heard it a hundred times, but there is um, the chat function, so you can go ahead and put your feedback there. And then there is a questions tab underneath the chat bubbles. It looks like a teacher standing in front of a chalkboard. Um, you may put questions there. However, um, Chris was unable to be with us um, today and his um, coworker and himself are going to respond to you guys via email if you do have any questions. So you can either send them straight to Val. That's going to be in the chat at the very top. I pinned it. Or if you do put something in the questions tab, just be sure to put your contact information so that Chris can follow up with you um, after the conference. So um, just want to make sure that you knew that if you do have questions and you, you um, they will be responded to. So you can either send them straight to Val or you can put them there um, in the question tab. And then below that, where the three people are, that's where you can click the three people. You can see everyone that's in the session with us. If you click on their name, you can privately message them. So if you needed to tell me something in the middle of the presentation, you could click on my name and send me a direct message. And then below that, we have um, some files included. Um, it looks like the three sheets of paper, and it looks like Chris has been gracious enough to share the presentation with you, and it looks like a video, um, so he has included some files there for you as well, which is very nice of him. And so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, like I said, Chris um, Harper, who is with our solid waste division here at the city of Fort Worth, um, he is a contract compliance um, administrator was unfortunately unable to be with us very unexpected um, he was so excited about being here with all of you that he took some time really quick the other day to pre-record um, the presentation but he wants to know that you guys are more than welcome to send um, Val his co-worker her email address is at the top any questions or you could also leave him you can also email him directly, or I'm giving you the option to put some questions in the question tab. Just make sure that you put your contact information, and then I will send that over to Chris and Val after our presentation so that they can get back to you guys. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Chris um, and his workshop, Maintaining Service Continuity During Uncontrollable Circumstances. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Harper. I'm the contract services administrator for the city of Fort Worth for solid waste. Um, very happy to be here today. Uh, thanks everybody for coming to the NUSA conference. We are proud to host it as Fort Worth. Um, 
So today we're going to be talking about maintaining service continuity during an uncontrollable circumstance. Obviously, that is uh, COVID-19. So we'll, uh, we'll dive right into it here. I'll give you a little bit of context about the city of Fort Worth, how our solid waste program runs, uh, so you understand how important external contractors are to our success. So my theme today is going through this together versus going through this independently at the same time. So right, what do I mean by that? There's a big difference between going through a challenging time at the same time as others, each on your own, and actually doing it together. So the benefits of doing things together are additive, right? And, and what we were hoping for, what we achieved is that one plus one equals three result. So again, as I said, my name is uh, Christian Harper. I have the privilege of leading the contract compliance team here in the city. I oversee uh, teams that handle residential collection, that's garbage, recycling, bulk, uh, yard waste, recycling processing, residential cart program, mulching, and city facilities uh, collection. Also includes our Southeast landfill that's owned by the city and our uh, waste connections c and landfill that we use. I've been with the city about uh, three years and it has been a, uh, an incredible experience so far. So a little background on our leadership team. Brandon Bennett is our code compliance director. He's been with the city of Fort Worth uh, since 2004. He's been the director for the past 11 years. Uh, Robert Smouse, who's our assistant director of solid waste, has been with us for six years. So uh, both of them have seen uh, quite a bit of uh, evolution in our program. So these are the people that really make it happen. I have a team of three uh, contract compliance specialists, Jocelyn Johnson, Keith Christian, and uh, Val Famolo. So again, it, they've been here all of them over 18 years since the beginning of the program. So invaluable uh, resource to me and to the city and to the residents. So again, background, the city and waste management have actually been working together since 2003 when the CART program was initially rolled out. So this is a well-established relationship. Our MWBE subcontractor, Night Waste, has been working with waste management since 2006. So we are very fortunate to have uh, excellent partners who have a ton of experience that was brought to bear over us, you know, the, the past year. So forward at a glance, you've probably seen me, 895,000 residents, uh, 13th largest in the, in the US. We service over 240,000 households weekly. Uh, something that shocked us, we grew as a city at over 3% during the pandemic. So to put that in perspective, our three-year average is just over 2% as is the five-year average. So um, at a time when everything was, was happening uh, with increased tonnage, we were also growing uh, at, a, at a rapid pace. So services at a glance, as I mentioned, we at the city, we use all outside contractors for residential collection, recycling processing, disposal, uh, operation of landfill, organics recycling, uh, and carts. So we're heavily dependent on our outside partners and our program is all cart based and we use ASL trucks. It's been that way since 2003. Um, quick breakdown, waste management and night waste service all residential collection. Republic Services is our partner for recycling processing, disposal at the Southeast landfill, um, city collections, drop off station hauling. Coder is our cart uh, partner. All of our organics recycling and mulching goes through Living Earth. And we also have a contract with Waste Connections to use their c and landfill here in Fort Worth. So residential collection, yard waste, uh, including craft bags, uh, yard carts, small brush, all of that is, is collected by hand in rear loaders. We also have boom trucks, obviously, for uh, large bulk and bulk waste or brush. Uh, weekly collection of garbage recycling and yard waste. Our bulk program is monthly. Currently, we co-mingle large brush and bulk trash. There's about uh, 500,000 carts in service. So we, we've got a lot of carts out there and the city does own all the carts. Recycling processing, again, is with Republic Services at the North Texas Recycling Complex. It's been that way since 2018. 100% of what's picked up at the curb in our blue recycling carts is taken there. Uh, disposal, City of Fort Worth owns the Southeast Landfill. Republic Services under contract to manage it. 
all of our uh, residential waste uh, goes to that landfill, as do all the residuals from the MRF. Some bulk is disposed there. The remaining bulk is disposed at the Waste Connections uh, CMB landfill. Uh, Living Earth does all the organic recycling, like I mentioned. The contract is actually with Republic Services. Uh, Living Earth is actually on site at the landfill and they do all the work. Um, again, Toter provides all the carts. They also provide cart delivery, cleaning, maintenance, and repair. We have four drop-off stations in an environmental collection center. Uh, those are open to all residents for a uh, full line of services, which is you know garbage, recycling, yard, bulk. You can drop off house, household hazardous waste, scrap metal, tires, electronics. We even offer document trade. Uh, to give you an idea how popular these things are, they receive over 300,000 resident visits per year and over 46,000 tons of material come through these locations. Uh, the Environmental Collection Center services over 20,000 residents just at that one facility and 2.2 million pounds of material come through there, which we're really proud of because all that means all of that material is actually uh, disposed the way it should be. We also have an in-house call center here operated by the communications team. Last year, they answered a little bit over 86,000 solid waste calls. So how we're uh, organized internally, the city actually maintains a small fleet of boom and roll off trucks. Those are used by our illegal dump crews. That equipment has been uh, just a, a, a blessing for us to have for not only storm damage, but over the past year with COVID, with the, the increase in uh, not only illegal dumping, but in uh, bulk. So as I mentioned, those trucks can be used to back up other uh, other programs. So we have six staff members who are dedicated to uh, working with waste management and verifying that all of our uh, bulk piles are collected on time. We have six staff members called the Blue Crew who actively audit uh, our blue recycling carts and look for contamination and help educate our residents to increase the uh, percentage and quality of recycling. We also have six account techs, then they're dedicated to uh, customer service, setting up accounts, changing accounts, all of that uh, good stuff. So how did it start, right? For, for all of us, it started in March. And I will say that the city is fortunate to have a former first responder as our director of code compliance. Um, Brandon Bennett actually serves two roles for the city. Um, some of you may not know that. He's the director of code compliance and he's also the director of health. Okay, side note, he's an Iron Man, right? So how else would he have the energy to perform two completely separate jobs and do it all at the same time in, in, uh, in the 24 hours he has in a day? So his philosophy that, that permeates the organization all the way down to the frontline staff is always be prepared. He's a situational leader, which means that we are flexible and adaptable. And that put us in a very good position when COVID hit because we are able to change when we need to and, and take care of what needs to be uh, taken care of. But I'll say like the rest of you, we were not really prepared for a pandemic. We have a coup, we have all of those plans, but th this was uh, something unexpected. So we had literally uh, updated our coup plans, um, continu continuity of operational planning. Uh, we planned for a disruption. We didn't know at the time how long that would last. Uh, I don't think that we originally planned for the duration of over a year and the scale it was at, but we did have a number of contingencies planned for, including uh, staffing and equipment, so that helped. So what really actually helped us in the normal course of business in March, our whole staff is ramping up. That is the beginning of heavy yard and bulk season. Uh, we were bringing in storm chaser crews, which waste management does on an annual basis to take care of the increased volume. So again, fortuitous because they, they hit the ground at the exact right time. Um, so I will say at the beginning, we were prepared, we prepared to jump in and, and start navigating uh, on our own, right? Talking to each department, talking to our health department, but we quickly realized that there would be a huge benefit from collaboration, right? This means other people, departments, city, industry groups, SWANA, uh, the, the COG. So it's always better to navigate this situation together. So again, um, the, the, the one plus one equals three is the, the result we were, we were going for and in, in which we got. So initial planning scenarios, we extended 
plan for an extended time frame. Uh, we had plans in place that we lost 40% of staff uh, being out due to COVID. We extended hours. We knew we were going to have increased overtime, and we reallocated staff and equipment uh, to support essential services. A good example of that is our blue crew. It was no longer safe for them to go and physically look in blue uh, recycling carts for contamination. So we turned them into uh, a hotshot crew. They worked at the drop-off station. They worked in any capacity uh, that was needed uh, to do in, until they could return to their job. So uh, one of the, the biggest challenges that I'm sure everyone on here faced uh, this was a nationwide challenge. We were used to emergency situations where a situation is confined to a, usually a geographic location, right? So personnel and equipment can be brought in from other areas of the country. In this case, everybody was you know, subject to the same uh, emergency situation. So yeah, we, we had to uh, reallocate resources within because there, there was nothing coming from anywhere else, right? And, and we, they certainly didn't have extra staff to, to, to share. So planning assumptions, again, we knew residential uh, volume would increase. The tonnages that are typically generated at work, whether that's uh, garbage or recycling, were going to be generated at home. Uh, we were going into spring break, which we knew would be an increase anyway, uh, followed by summer when kids and, and adults are home. So we also expected commercial uh, to go down, which it did due to stay-at-home orders and, and multiple businesses closing. Uh, we had originally assumed that the growth of new households in the city would slow down, but uh, boy, were we wrong on that one. So tool plan in action, just the highlights, right? The big things were the safety plan. Safety had to come first. We had to ensure that we were able to keep staff healthy and safe in order to perform the work, right? That meant that some people went and worked from home. That meant other people uh, continued to come into the office. But we, we followed all of the safety rules uh, and, and as did our partners. And I think we were very successful in that. We looked at everything that we could possibly control and exerted as much control over those factors as we could, right? And realized that, hey, there, there's a whole lot that we don't control and that we're just gonna have to be uh, flexible. So the biggest, benefit uh, or improvement that we made is we increased the daily data gathering and reporting. So we needed to know what's happening at the curb on an hourly basis so that we could respond. Um, again, like probably everyone on a call, all of our solid waste staff were designated essential staff members. Uh, all contractors were uh, designated essential staff. We immediately prioritized garbage, then recycling, then bulk and yard. A um, good example here of essential workers, <clears throat> excuse me, um, waste management had a placard that they put in all their trucks, uh, as did Republic Services and Night Waste. They actually had these in their personal vehicles as well, so that during the stay-home orders here in Texas, uh, in case they were pulled over or questioned, uh, people knew that they were on the way to their job. Forward staff did the same thing, and in fact, uh, in an effort to cut down person-to-person -person contact each of our team was given a placard to put in and put their own cell phone number. So even if they were doing an investigation or talking to a resident literally outside their house, they did it via phone from inside their car. Um, I, I, I had to throw this in here. It was so sweet. There was a, uh, a group of kids who had created this thank you essential worker sign. So uh, we absolutely loved seeing that. Uh, you know, everybody at home was having a hard time too. And it was it was kind of great to feel the love from the, the community that we were still out there uh, working hard on their behalf. So biggest change, right? Daily operations calls, and, and this was multiple a day. This was an open exchange of information and ideas. Any idea was welcome, right? We, we were trying to figure out this, this uh, pandemic as we went along. Any uh, risk mitigation strategy that we could come up with, we made a list of, so in case we encountered it, we knew what to do. Uh, we had the uh, contingency plans, who would back up who, right? And this goes back to what I mentioned before, the city does have some bulk uh, or some boom trucks, and those did come in handy backing up uh, our partners. So again, continuous uh, communication, 
gathering data, analyzing it, you know, turning that data into actionable information that can go out to our, our fields, can go out to the community and executing. And you know, we had to do it over and over again because things were constantly changing. Um, Again, the, the, our partners, our eyes and ears are all of the hardworking people inside the city and at all of our partners who are out, you know, in the city every day, uh, gathering information and, and sending it back. So one of the nice things was we have our own communications person here for solid waste. We took all the information we got, uh, turned that into usable information, fed it to the communications team, the community engagement team, the call center team. So we got that information back to the residents uh, who called as soon as we possibly could. So again, following all internal uh, city safety team advice and, and, and guidance, our partners did that uh, with their safety teams as well. Uh, we had a lot of conversations on uh, best practices, what to share, what we were learning uh, and, and how we could help one another. Um, so when we got to probably the third week in March and realized, okay, we're, we're going to have to really figure this out. So we put ourselves in the residence shoes and we said, okay, we've got to empathize with the people who are actually generating the waste, right? So what flexibility do we have in each program and ordinance? How could we extend all of that flexibility to the residents? And it, I guess it, to say it a different way, what program adjustments could we make immediately, right? to help the situation that we didn't need to clear through legal, that didn't need to go to city council for approval because speed and flexibility were critical. So we really took a hard look at what we could do, right? So we were very successful to come together with uh, waste management and night waste, go through all these these ordinances and, and programs and come up with a plan. So we actually um, came up, I think we met on uh, a Wednesday put the plan together, got it approved up the chain and actually had full implementation that, that following Monday. Um, one of the biggest things was extra bags, right? People were putting bags on the ground, people were putting bags, making a snowman out of the cart, they were putting them on the lid. So we had to figure out how to get those bags off the ground. Luckily, we had a mechanism in the contract already to compensate our uh, contractor for extra bags. And really the, what was driving this is we didn't have time to go back again, right? If the truck was there, we had to figure out a way to collect everything the, the first time, right? And again, waste management and, and night waste were, were critical in, in helping us figure that out. So this was the uh, meeting summary, right? From Wednesday to, to, to Monday, created the plan, got that implemented. So operational issues, you know, to, to put it, a picture's worth a thousand words. We had so many people who were at home that were just parking on the street. And this picture illustrates what our guys had to go through on a, a house by house basis, right? So not much space for them to put the ASL arm in. There was a lot of getting in and out of that cab. The, these drivers really, really worked their tails off to, to get this done. Um, perfect example of what I mentioned before, you know, any bags uh, in the car, bags on the ground, which again, we, uh, we turned that into more of a normal collection because that that became the norm it was expected uh it was actually kind of nice we came across somebody who didn't have a bag um our residents got a little creative uh on as everybody knows I'm, I'm sure it's the same in every other uh, city people were just cleaning out everything attics garages uh you name it and whatever they decided to clean they dragged out to the curb um, other people must have had barbecues and, and other things going on because again we, we saw a lot. So something like this, we we just basically would take take the cart and uh, everything on there and then uh, would, would bring them a, uh, a new cart. So we did have some operational issues due to COVID. Unfortunately, uh, our environmental collection center was closed for a week, which uh, is not truly a seven day week. They have a three day uh, operational uh, week. Several staff members had tested positive and exposed other staff members. We immediately uh, cleaned and disinfected that. We had an outside company who was able to clean and disinfect. We also had uh, the folks at our police department had uh, disinfecting equipment, which was fantastic because the response time was, was much, much faster. And honestly, the cost was, was much cheaper uh, this thing. So we did lose one drop-off station uh, for a number of hours. And if you remember 
the, the volume of people that and, and tonnage I said was going through there, every hour counts. We had lines of, you know, 50 to, to 100 people waiting to get in there. So luckily, all of those supervisors have the training and the knowledge to address those situations, get those uh, staff members taken care of, get those facilities clean, and get those facilities back online in a safe way. So give you just a, a glance into our tonnage, right? And, and one of the challenges with COVID was all tonnage decreased across the board. So waste management had to utilize every piece of equipment, everybody uh, on staff as did night waste, as did, as did the city, because no one had extra resources. So garbage immediately went up over 12%, bulk went up over nine, yard waste uh, increased 16. The, the Southeast landfill had a total uh, of over 10% increase, which when you consider that at any given time, commercial was down in uh, North Texas, around 30%, uh, the residential volume more than made up for that. Uh, the MRF, I think we ended the year at just over 17% uh, increase in tons of material received and processed. Uh, it was going at, at most of the time, seven days a week. Uh, the only time that they had downtime was for uh, repairs and maintenance to keep all that going and, and they did a great job. Again, our drop-off stations, increased tonnage, increased residence visits, increased number of 40-yard uh, roll-off containers that we filled and then hauled. So the, the drop-off stations were a, a tremendous outlet for residents and really, really took some pressure off of the city, took some pressure off of uh, waste management, which was good for everybody. So our response, uh, as I mentioned, uh, had to adapt and evolve. Things were changing constantly. We were seeing uh, different shifts in um, volumes in different neighborhoods. Um, based on their spring breaks, based on what was going on with, with summer. We had to contend with uh, safety changes at the national level, state level, local level, all of these different things coming in uh, had to be uh, read, understood, and, and sent out and, and, and followed. One of the biggest advantages of having outside companies uh, work with us is that, you know, for example, Waste Management Republic companies, national publicly held companies, they were able to go out, talk to all of their municipal people and give us ideas of, hey, here's what other people are doing around the country, right? Here's how we can do things better. And just as importantly, here's what you don't want to do, right? Here's where, where we've, we've gotten into trouble. So uh, avoidance of issues and best practices, that, that combination was incredibly powerful for us. Um, again, uh, get back to disposal options. In addition to the curb, right, we have what we call beyond the curb, which again was the, the, the drop off stations. We've kind of covered this. Um, one of the biggest things that we had to take into account is our contractual considerations, right? So all major municipal contracts have a uncontrollable circumstance. Uh, we're no different. We have those in, in all of ours here at the city. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had multiple partners uh, declare an uncontrollable circumstance because I, I can't think of one that fits the bill better than, than a pandemic. So in, to their credit, and this goes across all of the, uh, the, the companies that we worked with, they continued to perform. They bent over backwards um, and even outperformed some months last year, uh, even in dealing with, with what they had to, to deal with. But it was very critical that with the contractual part that we did take care of that, that we did run things by legal, uh, both at the city side and the contractor side. So one of the things that working with national companies like Waste and, uh, and Republic helped us do is say, okay, we need to plan ahead, right? Plan for holidays, plan for risk exposure. We learned a lot from spring break and we learned a lot when people went on vacation. And so we knew that we were going to have to be more vigilant uh, that all of our contractors were on Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, anytime people were getting together, uh, we had to make sure that following that, we had contingencies in place in case we had people out. Because not only does the volume go up after a lot of these holidays, but a lot of the times uh, due to COVID, we had people out. So that was kind of a double win. Um, 
additional external partners that were invaluable to us. Uh, North Central Texas Council of Government, uh, they hosted multiple calls and, and roundtables where cities just got together and in an open forum just said, hey, here's what we're doing. Tell us what you're doing. Uh, a, a really positive flow of information back and forth. Again, what to do, best practices, what not to do. Uh, questions were answered. Um, so huge, huge resource. Uh, we have a lot of other contacts at other cities that we reached out to. We had cities reach out to us. Again, the, the just free flow of information was extremely valuable. A uh, little shout out to local distilleries. Um, I don't know any, if anyone else on the call or in the, uh, the session had this, but they were a lifesaver. We would get five gallon buckets of hand sanitizer. Uh, some of it admittedly smelled a little bit, uh, so you would smell like old uh, tequila or other <laughs> other alcohol, but I, I, I'm telling you, it, it, it worked and, and we, were, we were real happy to get it. Uh, we used the Recollect app, we call it Forward Garbage and Recycling app. That was very, very helpful in um, sending out service alerts and keeping our residents updated on scheduling and any, any uh, potential disruption. So, Internal department coordination, right? Most of what I've been talking about is external. Our external partners actually interface with a lot of our internal departments besides solid waste as, as well. And, and we encourage that. Um, so some of the biggest help we got was from our Joint Emergency Operations Center. That's where all of the uh, safety information and, uh, and guidance came from. Our safety team, I want to give uh, special recognition to Julie Ragland. She started as the solid waste safety coordinator, I think a week and a half before COVID. So her immediate responsibility at a brand new job was to organize a response to a pandemic, right? So uh, talk about a, a, a difficult challenge, but she rose to, to the occasion and has been a uh, invaluable resource to us and, and kept us all safe. So we were very happy to, to have her on board. Um, as I mentioned, we have an internal call center. They took over 86,000 calls for solid waste. Uh, Sharon Gamble runs that group. They immediately uh, went remote uh, to make sure that they were minimizing any exposure. It worked great. It was seamless. We had no interruption to uh, solid waste to our, our staff or more importantly to the resident community to get in touch with the city. They continued to roll out uh, My Fort Worth app which, which also supports solid waste in, in other areas of the city. Um, our administration, HR and, and financial staff did the same thing. Uh, we needed them to be in place and they, they chose to go remote as well. Uh, ben Carson picked that up and uh, Shelly Hollers for solid waste. So again, they, with help from IT, it was fantastic. They were all able to go remote and we had no uh, interruptions. The communications office, uh, which has been a, a huge, huge help, and that's Diane Covey and, and Lola McCartney. They, this is what I, I was talking about before when we got information from the curb, right? What's happening at the curb? What's happening with uh, collection times, our ability to collect? All of that information was then uh, put in their hands for them to get that out to residents, whether that was uh, city news, other communications, uh, social media, all of these things. It, it, it was really a, a huge, huge help. Same thing with Catherine Huckabee's group in, in community engagement and, and all of her team. We provided them with information and they were the conduit to get that out to HOAs, to neighborhood organizations, right? The, the organizations where residents would say, hey, what am I supposed to do, right? Hopefully that was, uh, all of that information was there for the HOA uh, when they, they needed it. All of our billing goes through the water department. Um, again, huge, uh, Props to them. They were able to continue to operate. We had zero uh, billing interruptions, which is good for us, but it, it's critically important to the residents. We understand that our residents had so many more things to worry about. Uh, I mean, the list goes on from childcare to health to jobs to everything. We didn't want to give them anything else to stress or worry about. So we tried very hard and, and coordinated internally and externally to, to get that done. Um, so the reality check, right, and this is internal and external, the, the human toll of operating during a pandemic. So everybody was affected by this in, in some way. 
approximately a third of our staff in solid waste at any given time had uh, COVID-19. Um, many staff had family and friends who had COVID. We had exposures, we had people out, you know, and, and, and that becomes your, your focus is making sure that these, these staff members, their people, their friends, their family are, are, are getting any uh, treatment and taking any precautions they need. Um, we had staff members, unfortunately, who lost family and friends to COVID-19. It, it, it was just an awful uh, situation all the way around. Same with our vendor partners. We would get reports from uh, night waste, from waste management. Okay, who's in, who's out, how many drivers, how many backup staff, how many um, people in their, their maintenance facility were, were in or out. Um, and one of the things that really, really hit us hard here in solid waste is in December, we actually lost uh, a member of our, our code solid waste team to uh, COVID-19. So um, out of respect for, for him, uh, I'd like to just pause here uh, a moment and let everybody just kind of, I guess, reflect and, and acknowledge everybody in our entire uh, industry, all of our cities, all uh, country and, and, and the world who was uh, affected by that. Um, getting kind of back into it, um, we we took a hard look at our operational uh, philosophy, um, and really, this to be successful in a pandemic, it had to be about servant leadership at, at, at all levels. And if you remember the three people I introduced at the beginning of the presentation, uh, Val and, and, and Keith and Jocelyn, they absolutely Im embodied this. This was not about taking the credit. This was about giving the credit and helping whenever and however possible. It didn't matter if it was somebody on my team. It didn't matter if it was a external uh, contractor. It didn't matter if it was president. Anybody who, who needed help or who needed everything, everybody uh, in, in, in code and, and through the city um, provided whatever they could, uh, whenever they could. So another benefit to code is that the entire code compliance and, and especially solid waste the culture here is like a family. They really, really take care of one another. Um, a lot of people have been here for a long, long time. They know each other personally. And it, they that's what I think got a lot of people through is, is, is that, that level of caring. So um, the other thing was we had to balance, like I mentioned, getting the job done, uh, not acknowledging contractual obligations, processes, but you know what? being flexible in those and you know a handshake deal and an agreement that said okay we need to get a certain process uh, implemented in order to be successful and then we'll worry about um, getting it uh, on paper and, and formally agreed to uh, a little bit later uh, and a lot of that was the that first program that we we were able to implement uh, in, in march um, i'll say again that solid waste staff uh, just displayed an incredible amount, amount of bravery and pride and passion and commitment to their job, as did everybody uh, at Waste Management and Night Waste and Republic and, and Toter, um, Living Earth, everybody uh, did what they could. We refer to that in, in code compliance as an outward mindset. That's uh, putting the residents first, uh, exceptional customer service, really wanting to be successful in, in, in helping again where, wherever you can and uh, you know uh, amazingly over the course of all of these months you know people just seem to, to find another gear and, and be able to physically and, and mentally be able to weather this you know for an extended period of time under you know at times very uh, adverse conditions so you know the our, our, our staff, you see Daniel over there by his truck, the, the team at Night Waste um, in the middle there. We've got all of our crew uh, at Waste Management having their meetings outside, getting ready to uh, to roll out uh, the day and, and, and collect for our uh, our residents. So key people challenges that, that we had to overcome and that we spent a lot of time talking to uh, all of our partners in, in other cities with, staff fatigue from workloads, right? There's only so much people can do. They've got other things to, to worry about. Uh, the stress from COVID affecting their friends and family. Um, overcoming complacency, honestly, from following so many safety guidelines for so long a period of time, right? Some of them just become second nature. 
it. Some of them, you know, you actively have to remind people every day, be vigilant, 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 and that's the only way it's going to work. Um, and then not only do you, do you have to learn something new, right? Something else is going to come along. So you've got to adapt to new safety measures, operational processes, and procedures. So uh, a little bit of fun employee recognition. Um, I don't know if there's any hockey fans out there, but we had uh, Jeff Kay from the Dallas Stars and uh, his, his look on his face right here is pretty funny, but I'll, I'll play you the video of uh, what we did there. And hopefully you all can hear this. Hey, Waste Management Team of Fort Worth, it's Jeff Kay, public address announcer for your Dallas Stars. On behalf of the entire city of Fort Worth, I just wanted to say, you rock! You're putting in a star performance every day. All of Fort Worth appreciates you. You're all frontline essential team members who score goals for our residents every day. And the Dallas Stars salute you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and thanks again for all you do. Go Stars! So we thought that was fun. We did a, uh, a version of that for waste management, for night waste. We did it for our solid waste team. We did it for code compliance, and it, it was just a, a nice little little bump, hopefully, and uh, a, a bit of, of recognition uh, at, at a hard time. So um, the evolution of our response uh, operationally and contractually became at some point, right, a crisis begins to stabilize and you have to get to a point that becomes the new normal. And for us, that was October 1st. That coincided with our beginning of our new fiscal year, but it also uh, was about six months of operations which allowed us, waste management, night, uh, Republic Services, everybody was used to what that new volume was. So we, we went ahead and uh, tried to get back to creating a, that as, as a new norm. And then if anything changed, we would uh, work, on, work on that. Um, so we also tracked data and reporting on a daily basis, which then became weekly. And so what we were trying to do is we baselined an average of the last three to five years, depending on the category. We looked at 2020, we looked at the delta between them, and then we tracked to say, okay, how far are we above? And, and when do we think that we're going to, if we were, right, plateau back to what we would consider a normal year or a normal year adjusted for, uh, for growth? So we, have, we actually came back to... Um, normal what we would call normal in bulk uh probably in late october but one of the things that uh, i am most proud to put on the screen because there's there was so much work uh, that went into it by countless people and countless hours is that we did not experience any meaningful delays in any service line collection from march 2020 to february 2020 and uh, david uh Biederman, who's the executive director of SWANA, had put out a, a, a quote that said a substantial number of cities are experiencing delays in waste collection as a result of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So again, we were very, very happy to report that we, we did not. Um, and I can tell you that our residents were, <laughs> were sure happy as well. Did we make mistakes along the way? You know, did we get probably more missed pickups and, and have some hiccups? Absolutely, we did. Uh, but we tried very hard to rectify those issues as soon as we could. Uh, we communicated with residents, apologized profusely, and, and did the best we could. So dedication and adherence to safety measures is really what allowed that to happen because the ongoing availability of our staff and our equipment was paramount to success. If we didn't have drivers, if we didn't have people um, doing data input, doing their job every day, the, the whole system wouldn't work. So funny uh, thing happened along the way, right? We were doing so well, managing a pandemic. And uh, so the insult to injury was uh, snowmageddon. <laughs> the week of February 15th, we actually, for the first time in program history, had no residential collection for a week. Uh, there was a major snowstorm and believe it or not, it got down to zero degrees here in Fort Worth. Uh, I can attest to that. I lost power for three days. Uh, I burned every 
piece of firewood and, and anything that would burn. Uh, luckily, the pipes didn't freeze. I can tell you my family was miserable and the dog uh, did not enjoy that at all. So um, again, the only reason that we couldn't collect is that we physically, uh, our partners couldn't drive uh, on the street. So uh, finally, the, the nature found a way to, uh, to have us have a service interruption. So with that, uh, I, I will just thank everybody for taking part in the NUSA conference. Uh, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to present today and uh, for the city of Fort Worth to host this conference. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the other uh, events. And uh, I didn't think this one up myself. Uh, I listen to NPR and, and one of their hosts has a great closing. And I think I'll, I'll leave it at, you know, please take care of yourself. And if you can, take care of somebody else. Thank you very much. Hey everyone, um, I hope you enjoyed hearing from Chris. I really wish he had been here. Um, such an, he's such a nice guy and he's a great asset to our city. And I just love how he ended his presentation about taking care of yourself and if you can, you know, and taking care of somebody else as well. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you do have any questions for Chris, I know he'd love to hear from you guys. You can also email his coworker, Val. Her email address is at the top of the chat. And if you wanna leave any questions for Chris and Val, you can put them in the question tab. Just include your contact information and I will be sure to send it all in to them. And I know that they'll be um, excited to respond and, and hear from you guys as well. Um, I also believe at the bottom of your screen, you should have Chris's um, picture there. And I believe you can click on his, um, on his picture and, and then you can access his email address as well. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to leave them there. Um, and if not, I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye, say um, have a wonderful evening, and hopefully you guys will join us for um, one of our amazing neighborhood tours. Um, they're going to start at 5 p.m. Um, pick one out that sounds interesting, but don't forget that you will be able to see all of them um, on demand um, I believe you can see most of them right now, which is kind of cool. But um, by Monday, you will be able to access all of the workshop sessions that you weren't able to attend um, and all of the other awards programs and um, also the neighborhood tours um, on Monday. So thank you guys again for joining us for the NUSA conference. It's been so fun um, hosting it. Um, hopefully, I'll see you this evening at one of our neighborhood tours and in the morning as we celebrate some more amazing neighborhoods um, and neighborhood programs at the awards.